So in our previous lecture, we introduced the idea of a functional, and we talked a little bit about extremizing that functional. Remember, a functional was, was a, a, a function of a function. And um, what we're trying to do here is to uh, continue the discussion of extremizing that functional. I, I left the last lecture saying we, we needed something called the fundamental lemma of variational calculus to proceed further. Um, so let me begin and just kind of remind you where we had ended up. Uh, and then we'll we'll proceed to talk about this uh, this fundamental lemma. So recall, we were considering extremizing the functional given by uh, i, which is the functional of u, is equal to the integral from a to b of the integrand, which is a function f, which could be a function of x, u, and u prime uh, dx. Right? That was the, that was what we were trying to uh, to extremize, right? So our goal was to find the the function u such that the value uh, i of u was extremized. Okay, so we had reduced this to uh, where we had reduced this to the case where we had the integral from a to b of the uh, this integrand that looked like the partial of f with respect to u minus d by dx, uh, partial of f with respect to u prime uh, times this quantity a to x, this function, uh, ti uh, times dx or, uh, is equal to 0. Let's call that equation 2. Okay, uh, And then in the above, remember where, uh, in this case, uh, u of x um, is, is the extremizing function and a to x was an arbitrary function representing the variation from the extreme function. So remember uh, previously we had written that we had this varied path u tilde which which could be any path was going to be equal to the the path that extremized uh, the functional which was u of x right plus some uh, uh, small coefficient epsilon times eta of x, right, where eta was this uh, with this variation, and call that equation 3. Okay, that's how we had defined that. And that's where we left it. We basically arrived at equation 2. Um, and then what we need to do from here, I said, required something called the fundamental lemma of variational calculus. So uh, to proceed, we need that. So here it is, the fundamental lemma of variational calculus. What does it say? Let psi of x... Uh, be a continuous function between a and b, okay? Uh, and if the relation integral from a to b of psi of x times eta of x dx equals zero, which we'll call equation four, if that relation uh, holds for all functions eta of x uh, and, and that vanish when x equals a or x equal b, and a to x is continuously differentiable, okay, then the fundamental lemma of variational calculus says that psi of x itself must be equal to zero. Call that equation five. Okay, so that's the fundamental lemma. How do we prove that? So here's the proof. We're going to prove this by a method called contradiction. Um, I know that uh, not everybody uh, that's listening here has background in, in uh, formal proofs, so I'm just going to say sort of what, what the strategy here is. We're going to assume that equation 5 is not true, um, and then we're going to show that it leads to a contradiction uh, in equation 4. Okay? Okay, so let's go ahead. In this case, we'll let psi of x um, be, some, be different than 0. And let's say it's positive at x equals c. And, and c is somewhere between a and b. Okay, if that's true, then according to continuity, right, we have a continuous function psi of x. According to continuity, there's some small neighborhood um, where uh, psi of x is greater than zero, uh, right? And so the interval, we'll call it c minus delta. Um, and where x is in this neighborhood, and between c plus delta, right? We can always find a delta such that this is true. 
um, where uh, C of X is greater than zero, okay? Okay, since we can choose A to X arbitrarily, let's choose A to X such that, that uh, A to X is greater than zero on that same interval. And we'll go further and say that it's zero everywhere else. So what does that function look like? Well, if I were to draw, here's the eta that I'm proposing. And sometimes if you're in more formal mathematics, this will be called a test function. So maybe you're familiar with that. So there's eta of x. And let's say there, let's say this point is a, this point is b. We choose some value in the middle here, we call it c. Uh, and then maybe we have this being c plus delta, and then the same distance back c minus delta, right? And so what we're saying is that this function is positive in this interval, and so was, and then zero everywhere else, okay? So something like that, here's our test function. There you go, okay? So there's eta of x. So we have two positive functions being multiplied and then integrated so that we expect that to be a positive. So if we, if we do this, right? Um, okay, so this choice of a to x, of a to of x uh, results in the following, that the integral from a to b of c of x times a to of x dx uh, is then greater than zero. Call that equation six. This contradicts equation four, okay? So therefore, c of x must be equal to zero because when it's not, we just, we could do the same thing. Uh, if we let it be less than zero, we could follow the same proof, choose an a to x less than zero and we have the same thing. So the contradict, because it contradicts equation four when we didn't choose c of x equals zero, um, this contradiction actually proves that c of x is equal to zero, right? So uh, this contradicts equation four, therefore, c of x equals zero, and if we want to be our um, more mathematical self, QED, right, quad or rot demonstrandum. So, uh, so that's, that's the proof for the fundamental uh, lemma of variational calculus. So now let's go back and apply this lemma to equation two. So when we do that, uh, extremizing then requires Okay, that integrand, which was in brackets, right? That integrand be equal to zero, which is the partial of f with respect to u minus d by dx times the partial of f with respect to u prime. That quantity must equal zero. Let's call that equation seven. Okay, this is an important equation. Okay, equation seven is called the Euler-Lagrange Euler equation. And going forward, I'll just usually call this the EL equation. Uh, for uh, the functional, uh, I of U uh, is equal to the integral from A to B of F of X U U prime DX. Okay. So that's that formally is called the Euler-Lagrange equation. Uh, let me give you a few remarks about this. So here's some remarks. Uh, number one, we can expand the Euler-Lagrange equation given by equation seven via the chain rule. So to do that, let's just consider that term d by dx partial f with respect to u prime, right? So we have d by dx uh, partial f with respect to u prime. Um, just to avoid confusion, I'm gonna call this, this uh, quantity g just so we can uh, make it a little easier when we do the chain rule and I'm going to remind you that g because it's, it's the same as a function of f is a function of x u and u prime right so the chain rule then looks like the partial of g with respect to x plus the partial of g with respect to u times du dx plus the partial of g with respect to u prime times du prime dx. Okay. Uh, if I now go ahead and back substitute in for 
f uh, let g be uh, del f del u prime this becomes del squared f del x del u prime plus uh, del squared f uh, del u del u prime times du dx plus del squared f with respect to u prime squared du prime dx, right? What's du dx? That's u prime. What's du prime dx? That's u double prime. So this ends up being a partial square root of f with respect to x and u prime plus partial square root f with respect to u and u prime times u prime plus partial square root f with respect to u prime squared times u double prime. Okay, let's call that equation eight. Now I'm going to substitute equation eight into equation seven and multiply by negative one just so that I have a um, my u double prime terms uh, uh, being positive and and first basically. So we end up with uh, partial squared f uh, with respect to uh, u prime squared times u double prime plus partial squared f uh, with respect to uh, u and u prime times u prime plus partial squared f with respect to x and u prime minus partial f with respect to u. That's equal to zero. Call that equation nine. Okay, so that's the expanded out form of the EL equation. Remark number two. Um, whether we're maximizing or minimizing the functional i of u, the same EL equation is going to result. Okay, and so what that means is that the EL equation is a necessary condition um, for extremizing the functional i of u. Number three, sort of could be a corollary to number two, the EL equation is not a sufficient condition. Why is that? That's because just like we had with, uh, in the case of, a, let's say, a, a, a function of a single variable, uh, if we want to extremize that, we know that we have to take the derivative and set it equal to zero, just like uh, what we've done here. But when we do that, that says that it's, it's a necessary condition for an extreme value to occur, but we could have something like a stationary point. It's not an extreme value, right? So it's possible that we end up with something like that um, uh, by, by solving the EL equation so that it, it's not a guarantee that solving the EL equation extremizes you, but it is a necessary condition for doing so.